Hi everybody and welcome back to this channel. I'm Dr. Sam and today we are going to chat with another friend of mine and her name is Rushali Fernandez. Now Rushali actually completed her AGD and DMD program, the Advanced Standing DMD program through the Boston University. So let's go ahead and check her journey out. I did not know even a single soul in the US, not a single family member or friend or anybody that I could get help from. So, uh, you know, the whole idea of going to US, uh, even for interviews or to give my MBDE was out of question. I'm an artist and clinical dentistry is something I'm very, very passionate about. Hi, Vishali. Nice to see you online. Uh, it's been like ages since I last saw you. <laughs> Right, probably like six years yeah. or so. Hi, Sam. So nice to see you on this platform. It's amazing what you're doing with your. I know. Welcome to our I channel. Know, it's amazing <laughs> what you're doing with the whole YouTube channel. It's so informational, educational. I'm I'm really proud of you. So yeah. Thank you. I I think I'm having a lot of fun with this, uh, along with all the other boys. <laughs> anyway, tell me a little bit about you, Prashali. Like, what did you do in India? So hi everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Prashali Fernandez. I am a general dentist. I'm practicing in a suburb of Boston, Massachusetts right now. Um, I moved here nine years ago for my AGD residency. Sam and I actually graduated together, uh, what was it, 2009? Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a while. Uh, and then my master plan was actually to be in India, to do my master's in MDS, Master's of Dental Surgery, uh, specializing in endodontics. And uh, life happened. <laughs> And I'm here, so it's it's been quite a journey. So, what made you decide um, to come back to the US? <laughs> so, I had no intention of coming to the US. Absolutely zero intention. Uh, I thought <laughs> I'll you know do my MDS in Endo, and I'll have my own practice, and I'll be married in India with two kids, and be able to have a perfect balance of <laughs> <laughs> work and family life. Uh, so, coming to the US was not on the cards at all. Um, I gave my CET and uh, I didn't do as well as I w thought I would. Uh, my parents are very clear. They're like, you know, we have supported you all this time. Uh, now is the time to get married. If you want to pursue further education, it's going to be completely on you. We don't support this anymore. <laughs> so, so my only choice is since it was, it was an item. I was not ready to get married. Uh, so essentially, my only choice was to crack the MBS CET. Uh, get a great rank and get into a government college for specialty and I was very keen on doing endo as my specialty. I did not do as well as I thought I would in the CT exam. So I got into non-clinical, I got into oral pathology. <laughs> Nothing against it, but that was just not my <laughs> that was just not my cup of tea. Cup so of tea. one of the options was wait another year and try cracking the CT exams again or try different opportunities, different options. Uh, two of my best friends who are here right now uh, were applying and they were they had this very you know focused on moving to US and being here and doing their DMD and MS from here so my best friend encouraged me that like, you know why don't you apply your credentials are good you have a stellar GPA uh, you know you have a lot of extracurriculars just apply and see what happens so I started researching every possible program out there which would take an international student which did not have tuition, <laughs> which did not have NBD. <laughs> you know, those were my three criteria. And, and I, I'm sure you all watching this know that there are not a lot of options when you have such stringent criteria. No. So I chanced upon the AGD program and I was like, okay, this really sounds like something I would love to do. Uh, so I started researching more about it. Um, I came across three programs, which were essentially uh, in Northeast, which were completely tuition free or gave a full scholarship, uh, which did not require NBD part one or part two, which were willing to sponsor student visas. Uh, so yeah, and which were more clinical dentistry focused. So- um, Very important criteria right, actually, right. these ones. Because yeah. in my head, my friends were like, why don't you give NBD? Why don't you apply for DMD? You know, it's a little more easier way to go about things, more straightforward. And I actually wrote this yeah. poem in my uh, statement of purpose, which I truly, truly awesome. believe by. It's Robert Trost's poem. Please, please let us know. <laughs> but if I shall be saying this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I chose the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. 
And <laughs> wow, that is so awesome. And I literally, I love it. I literally ended up doing that. So, you know, it would have been easier to give my part one. It would have been easier to, you know, yeah. apply to those programs. And I was like, no, I'm going to take a chance. Take a leap of, leap of faith. I found three schools. One of them was uh, BU, obviously. That's where I did my A degree from. The second one was UConn in Farmington, Connecticut. Third one was Eastman Dental in Rochester. And I applied to all of those three programs. Uh, kept my fingers crossed that you know maybe they'll consider my application good right. enough. Maybe I'll get an interview call. And after that, I'll figure it out. I'll just bring right. it. <laughs> but I guess that was this just a right. little bit of faith and you know this persistence. This, also, more than anything, this, this intuition that something great is in store for me and something wonderful is going to happen. And call it my naivety, gullibility, you know, my optimism. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I think something wonderful is going to happen to me. I don't know how, I don't know when, but it's going to happen. So it was just insane amount of positivity, which essentially landed me here. I am with a little bit of luck, to be honest. <laughs> but going back, I mean, you know what? More than luck, it's also hard work. You work for getting that program, right? You, you must have written a great SOP and had. I mean, writing a poem in your SOP is one of the best things. I would have like, wow, <laughs> right? And then I don't think a lot many people would have gotten a poem. Yeah, this was actually so, this was actually for me. my second statement of purpose for my DMD because just to give a little background, you guys, I did AGD first. I actually worked on a limited license mm-hmm. for one year, and then I went back to school mm-hmm. to get my DMD. So I did it the other way around. Yeah. So it was my second statement <laughs> of purpose where I wrote that because everybody, everyone would ask me the same question: Why are you doing DMD after doing residency? And you know, so right. so yeah. So. Since you said the question, why did you do that in that uh, order? Because obviously because of the finances first. But then why did you feel the need of doing DDS afterwards after AGD? Because you could practice with AGD also, right? That's probably one of the major questions that all the viewers would want to know. I know people who have done that. So after AGD, there are few states where you can get a license to practice. I did not want to leave Boston. I loved Boston. Massachusetts is very strict with their laws, and they do need you to get a DMD from a code accredited school in order to get a mass license. So uh, one of the reasons was I loved Boston, and the second reason was I met my husband. That was the fact that I absolutely love Boston, and the fact that my husband loves Boston, and he never wanted to move out of here. So the only choice was essentially staying in Mass. And I did work on a limited license. So when I was working in the AGD residents work in the dental health center so it residency is completely clinical and i worked there and i love that and then for one year i used my opt to work on a limited license in the community health center which was very very different from all of my training in residency so not that i didn't love that but i got to see two ends of the spectrum i got to see the top notch high quality dentistry that i was trained to do and that i loved doing And then the more yeah, I remember you had done veneers and stuff during your AGD, yeah, I did veneers, right? I did full Which is amazing. Placed implants, did perio yeah. surgeries, did did a lot of fun stuff. Awesome. And then I started yeah, yeah. the health center where it was a lot of just extractions, partials, complete dentures, uh, fillings. So the opposite end of the spectrum. Nothing wrong about it. Nothing bad about it. But at the same time, I was very mm-hmm. clear in my head about my philosophy of dentistry and the kind of dentistry I want to practice. And the only way I could do that mm-hmm. was by getting going back to school, getting my DMD, and getting yeah, in a private yeah. practice setting here. So let's go to the next uh, question, which is yeah. So how did you apply for your AGD? So if I did my TOEFL. I had zero idea about TOEFL, and I wish I had your channel, Sam, because I literally <laughs> YouTube did like Google did one day before my exam, you know, the TOEFL format, and I just landed up <laughs> at the test center the next day. And I was, I was, I'm, I'm a bad example, you guys. I was very nonchalant about a lot of things. Uh, guys, she has amazing <laughs> English, so her. <laughs> I think she must have aced it even with the high study. I think I got like <laughs> studying for like it. Hundred and eighteen or hundred. Twenty. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, okay. I'll tell you this though. I come back home and I tell my dad I got like hundred and eighteen on hundred and twenty, and my dad is like, "Why didn't you get one twenty on one <laughs> twenty?" <laughs> Things worked out in your favor. Right? Yeah, yeah. It did. It did. I um, gave. Uh, I did my ECE credential conversion. Yeah, yeah. and then I applied through pass. 
So, BU, UConn, uh, and then Rochester, all of them were, the applications were through PASS. UConn was PASS and MATCH. BU did not participate in MATCH. And then Rochester had their own supplemental application. So, you know, everything else was on apart from that. Uh, so, yeah, that's how mm-hmm. I applied to them. I had to get uh, recommendation letters. I had to write an essay mm-hmm. for every school. And uh, I think that was it. That was it. Pretty much, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah, it, it almost kind of intermingles with MS. Very, residency, yeah, very similar. Because right? pass and match is usually for MS residencies yeah. and they need, yeah, TOEFL and sometimes GRE. Yeah. So, I don't know about GRE, oh, but I didn't, I I didn't have to give GRE, thank God. <laughs> I didn't have to, yeah, oh, I didn't have to give GRE. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I did find out later that Rochester, uh, from that year, started taking tuition for that program. It was, it was like $10,000. It wasn't a lot. So I eliminated Rochester, mm-hmm. and then it was essentially between mm-hmm. uh, BU and UConn. So uh, mm-hmm. I got my first, so after my applications were done, I got my first interview call actually from Rochester. So, uh, mm-hmm. I was working in India before applying to all of this. I was working in a clinic. So, I liquidated all of my savings, converted them to dollars, uh, bought tickets to come to US, uh, looked at the cheapest accommodation in hostels and stuff where I could stay. Yeah, I mean, that's how <laughs> yeah, it happens, right? Looked at the cheapest yeah, accommodations <laughs> just to make it work. So, first call was from Rochester, interview call. Right before I was about to leave, I got a call from UConn for an interview. And then BU uh, did not start processing applications until, I believe, November or December, I'm not sure. Once their cutoff date was done. And all of this was nine years ago, so I don't remember the details. But I know that they were not, yeah, they were not processing applications. So, went for an interview to Rochester. Uh, I decided not to pursue it just because of the tuition. Went for an interview to UConn, Mm -hmm. went very well. Uh, And then I just showed up at BU one fine day. So I went to meet the program director's administrative assistant and I'm like, hey, are you guys processing applications? And she's like, no, we are not doing it yet. I was like, well, I have liquidated all of my savings. This is the only chance I'm going to get to come to the US for interviews. So if you guys do decide to interview me one month later when you start processing applications, I will not be able to come back. So she's like, you know, I understand. She's like, oh my God, who's this girl? She's just like showing up and demanding essentially to be interviewed. So I was, right. <laughs> so she's like, honey, you know, that's not how it works. You poor thing. <laughs> she's like, you know, we need to review all the applications. The deadline is October 31st. So we'll start reviewing them in November. And we usually go by GPA. So we start evaluating the highest GPA first and then we go down the row. I was like, great. So I'm a 4.2. You might want to start with mine. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> she, was, she was just shocked by how ballsy I was. <laughs> but that, that works. It, 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 That's a nice it, work. It work you know? Because yeah. literally one week later, and this was about one week before I was supposed to leave the US to come back to India. So just the time, time, they called me and they're like, we are making an exception and you're going to be one of the first candidates we are going to interview. So can you come in on this date? I was like, yeah, I'll make it work. Uh, so I went, to, awesome. I went to you. They showed me the school. They showed me the program. It was love at first sight. I fell in love with Boston. I loved BU. They were one of the pioneers with digital dentistry. So way back in 2011, they had the Serec machines and the um, scanners, Fantastic. Trio scanners, Ultra scanners. And... Um, it was a very cross-oriented program, so I, I loved it. So I met with the program director. My interview was like two hours long. I went with another chair of the program. That interview was three hours long. Uh, we are chatting about <laughs> everything on the sun. And then I go back to school and I was like, I thought I'm done, right? And she's like, honey, you have a bench test. I was like, I what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so here I get a typo on. And uh, they're like, okay, you're going to do a class two prep. You're going to do a class three prep. You're going to do a crown, a veneer, an inlay, and an onlay. <laughs> and I had never, ever done an inlay and an onlay prep in my entire life, apart from studying the theory in the world. But I think it all went well because, you know, I got into the program. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful how it all it, worked, I know, right? It was, it was God's grace. I mean, that was really ballsy of you to actually go there <laughs> and meet them. And I mean, hats off. Right? I, I think, mean, I think I it was like, just, I like it was that just luck, I think. And like I said, it was this whole positive thing that it's going to work out, you know. 
I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, being yeah. proactive. Actually, I mean, not to the point of being annoying, but so, you know, with me, it was genuinely a financial yeah. reason. Like I couldn't go again. There was no way I could have gone again. Was the AGD cycle very yeah. competitive? Uh, competitive. I guess it was. I was told that there are over six hundred applicants, and they had two positions for international students. So I guess the odds were very, very low. Uh, yeah, yeah. But but yeah, uh, I was waitlisted initially, and then they somebody dropped out, and that's how I got into the. But I think it it was very very competitive for sure. I don't know about UConn, if it would have worked out or not. I had a good feeling about it. I was just not. Into it at that point of time because it was very surgery oriented and this was more process oriented. Especially now, it's even more competitive to be very honest. Because yeah. I think, especially yeah. because of COVID, a lot of people want to do GPR, want to do AEGD, and it it does train you to be a better dentist for sure. There's no doubt about that. So yeah, yeah. I think it is a very competitive program, but it's totally worth it. Yeah, and plus you are also running against other applicants from yeah. US. Yeah. So. Right? So it's even more. So, yeah, so BU to get had twelve residency seats, out of which ten were reserved for uh, American students, and then two were for international students. And out of those ten, I think they had four which were for BU grads, which were like you know set aside for BU grads. So uh, mm-hmm. I was the only Indian in my program. It was fun though. It was a great learning experience. uh got to meet people with different cultures i think i learned more from my colleagues than i did from my professors to be honest i mean my faculty was great and they taught me so many things but that was more of about clinical dentistry didactic dentistry uh what i learned from my colleagues how to interact with patients uh you know just overall i think these things are extremely important I, especially like interact patient interaction is so important right if the patient is not comfortable they exactly. can't trust you into doing it and and none of the treatment plans yeah. will work and the right? thing is for me to come yeah. straight off the boat from india and landing into the residency program and starting clinics on my second day after orientation uh it was a challenge it wasn't easy because obviously the way you work in india the way you do dentistry in india the whole thought process the philosophy is so different agd was all about comprehensive mm-hmm. dentistry most of the dentistry that i practiced mm-hmm. in india was very needs based i'm in pain i need to see the dentist and the dentist dentist will take care of my pain but here it's more of a comprehensive well rounded approach you're looking at the patients not only teeth you're looking at your their gums their oral structure you're looking at doing an oral cancer screening you're looking at occlusion uh so it's it's right. a lot of parameters that you have to consider which i had zero idea about um so my colleagues my core residents were the ones who kind of they helped, they helped me a lot a lot so how was the experience in your agd program uh one year of agd was the best year of my professional life best year hands down uh it was great because bu again was very clinical oriented so i started clinics literally on my second day uh so we had didactic classes in the morning we had some preclins in the morning so i think it would be like 8 to 10 we had preclins and then 10 to 4 we would see patients and then again we had lectures from like 4 to 6 so it was a very intense program uh it was very and then we had to do tons of lab work we had to ditch our own dyes we had to cast our own posts uh we had to do a lot of pros lab stuff lab that work because we were integrated so closely with the pros program so i basically was in school 14 hours a day there were times when my co resident and i were in school till like 2 and 3 am in the morning uh we had to be on call so i remember going to school one day before thanksgiving when a patient broke her anterior six unit temp and wanted me to do it at like 10 am 10 10 pm in the night i had to go to school so we had to be on call uh, we were the ones who patients yeah. came to and we had to triage them to the other residents from other departments so it was it was it was intense it was a very very intense program very little breaks uh, definitely a good amount of didactic but the didactic was focusing a lot more on treatment planning uh case presentation mm-hmm. we had literature reviews so we had a lot along with patient care so there were some really long days it was one year of intense training but essentially mm-hmm. that training has made me the kind of dentist i am today i would be nothing without that training i had you talked about working on a limited mm-hmm. license can you tell me a little bit about that so after agd right um because i was in a student visa i was an f1 i got one year of opt and 
my master plan was eventually to go back home to india because i had a i was working in a practice in india my mentor wanted eventually me to take over uh but uh i thought might as well work in the us for one year since i do have the work permit uh which is f1 obd for one year and see how it goes so my mm-hmm. options are limited because uh, either i could work as a faculty in a dental school or i could do limited license in a community health center because those are the only two situations where you can get a limited license and practice in massachusetts without mm-hmm. having a dmd uh i did apply to be a faculty in bu but i was so green uh that obviously i was not a good candidate to teach bu students because i had not gone through the whole program myself so i was did not come across as a very confident person to be an instructor or a faculty member for bu i applied in a bunch of health centers in the boston area and i got into one of them actually which was 5 minutes away from home which was very closely affiliated with bu um and i got you know the job to work on a limited license i have paid peanuts <laughs> which was a compromise because well, you know that's yeah but i got to i got to work i got to practice and uh, you know it was working in a health center so a lot of palliative dentistry a lot of emergent you know urgent care dentistry uh nothing mm-hmm. high end nothing crazy basically patients come in if they have cavities you fix them with fillings if they have bad broken teeth mm-hmm. you extract them and then you give dentures so that was pretty much it but it was busy we had uh two patients every one hour so our appointments were half an hour long so it taught me to become really fast mm-hmm. it taught me time it's management fast. exactly and i got tons of practice with extractions i was not very confident with oral surgical procedures mm-hmm. and extractions but um, i got tons of practice like i used to do maybe extract four to five teeth every day so i got a lot mm-hmm. of practice and now i kill it with oral surgical procedures i even feel confident enough to do full bony impressions you know so yeah awesome. <laughs> yeah perfect i mean look at the good points in every situation like you got a lot of surgical mm-hmm. experience mm-hmm. with that community health center right. clinic right so that is also awesome. like i got to learn a little bit of everything from every location i mean every kind of practice setting i've been yeah. in and it's been ranging from a to z in the whole spectrum of practice settings and with every job i've had i've learned something it's all been a positive experience awesome awesome so after university you went to bu so how was your experience there so after agd uh, while i was working in the health center i gave my interview part one and i applied to the dmd program in bu Uh, and that was the only school I applied to because after doing residency, it was pretty much like walking, you know, yeah. come come to the yeah. school, pay the tuition, get the. You're degree. like home. This was it your was, home was school, home, basically. So you didn't want to yeah. go anywhere. Yeah. Else. Yeah. So after doing AGD, as a resident, you have a lot of privileges and perks in BU. Uh, we didn't have to get every single step checked by faculty. We didn't have to. Uh, we had full access to the. software essentially which students have a limited mm-hmm. access to we had remote access and all of that fun stuff so going from that to this was a was a challenge it wasn't easy especially because i was used to so many liberties of the rest uh and you know you, you must be feeling like your hands are tied so uh, yeah it was like you know okay so in in bu in the clinics you have to like do a little bit of class and call the faculty show it to them and again do a little bit call them show it to them and do a little bit and then fill it and then show it to them and then call them, show it to them and then every single step you have to wait for like 10 minutes to 30 minutes for the faculty to come and check and approve every single step so that was restricting i still had to do all of the preclinical uh, courses or requirements i was not exempt from that i was exempt from a couple of didactic courses so i had to do the preclinical requirements which was honestly a breeze like most of the faculty members knew me so they kind of gave me a hall pass and they're like yeah finish it up and go it's okay so most of my classmates from dmd know me as the girl who was never really there or who would come in and breeze out because i literally like it, it would it did not take me to hours it was easier yeah it did, yeah. It did not take yeah. me to hours to do a pre clinical class one i would finish in 10 minutes and i would be out my way out uh, so same hey. thing with clinics i still had all the requirements which most of the students have uh but it was really easy for me cuz uh it was a group practice system and uh most of the faculty knew me most of my core residents ended up becoming faculty so i did get a hall pass awesome. and they're like yeah we know you <laughs> just finish and get you know get out of here and let the other students who want to learn learn so it was it was it was easy for me a lot of people have uh, went yeah, faster a lot of people don't have happy memories of uh, bu dmd it can be very intense it can be very competitive it was not that 
it was very easy for me. Good, awesome, awesome. That's that's yeah. good. So I think the age really really helped you. Oh, one hundred percent. Making it 100%. easier. Yeah, yeah. I highly, highly recommend the program. Unfortunately, BU has stopped the AGD program. Uh, oh. Yeah, we, we wrote to the president, we petitioned, but it's not, they have discontinued the program. They have the same department, same faculty, but they run a program now, which is a full tuition program. But it's not a residency or no tuition oh. program anymore. So there's no more. So is that like... Is that a GPR program now? So it's called now, PGOE, or? so post uh, postgraduate oh. residency in operative and aesthetic dentistry. So it's called PGOE residency, mm-hmm. and uh, same faculty, similar coursework, focusing more on restorative and aesthetic dentistry, but it's not a zero tuition program anymore. So it's a, it's a full tuition graduate program, postgraduate program. So yeah. But you got lucky. Yeah. So oh my god, that was that. that was the best year of my life. <laughs> but but we would still recommend people choosing other G D programs in 100%. other places, right? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your life after dental school and after all of this. So life after dental school has basically been, you know, trying to find my perfect fit in the whole job market and the whole job situation. Uh, and I'm being very honest about it. When I graduated from dental school, obviously I was an international student who needed visa sponsorship. Uh, the goal was to basically get H-1B visa, uh, which a lot of small private practices don't want to do. So a lot of private practices want somebody who has a residency training, who is used to doing comprehensive dentistry. Uh, but the minute you say I need an H-1B sponsorship, it's like, oh yeah, we cannot do that. That sounds complicated. That sounds yeah. expensive. That sounds like a lot of work. So, unfortunately for me, uh, I didn't have an option but to work with DSOs because of visa reasons. So, I worked with Aspen. I was the director because of residency. They directly gave me the managing clinical director position. I was with them for about a little less than two years. uh, After which, I had to move to another DSO because I kept on kind of moving around in Massachusetts. I uh, loved when I was in Boston and I didn't have to drive. And, uh, you know, once I started working, I had to drive. But then we switched up. our homes so whenever I changed my home address I changed my job because I just couldn't drive for over an hour to get to work um, so mm-hmm. it was Aspen for about a little less than two years followed by Perfect Dental which was um, another DSO but completely seeing Medicaid patients or mass health patients so uh, two again very different uh, modalities or philosophies of practice of dentistry so I did that for two years again and then finally ended up moving to a suburb of Boston, bought a house and after that I'm working in a private practice setting. So finally I found my awesome. yeah, found my footing. Happy, yeah, medium. happy medium. I'm yeah. setting my roots here in um, this little town in Massachusetts. So, you know, finally it's kind of getting there. But usually with H1B, awesome. there's always that little obstacle or hurdle that you have to overcome where you need visa sponsorship yeah. and our options are very limited. Very difficult to find a private practice setting for somebody who's fresh out of school who will do your uh, visa sponsorship. Yeah, unless they themselves have gone through it, most True. private practitioners True. don't. So it's it's kind it of is. hard. It is. Yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. about, you know, being I, I agree, just finding the right uh, right fit. I actually learned a lot of things when I was with Aspen Dental. Um, they took me for leadership seminars and you know how to talk to patients, how to present treatment plans and I picked up a lot of things honestly uh, which has again shaped me into being the kind of dentist I am today or even with mass health practices. There was, it made me fast, it made me efficient, it made me, taught me time management you know so a little bit to learn from every and I'm, and I'm sure a lot of administrative duties as well right? yes I had to know about a lot of like supervisory duties because I was the director so I was involved with the way the clinic works the profit and loss statements the payroll so I had to be a little more cognizant of all of, of that aspect and down down the line this will definitely help you a lot because as a dentist you know we have to wear so yep. many hats of not just being the mm-hmm. clinician, but the manager, yep. <laughs> the accountant, yep. everything, right? So I'm sure it will help yep. you a lot. So being in the DSO was also kind of Oh, definitely, 100%. Right? I highly recommend it. Like, everyone should work for a DSO at least once in their life. Yeah, I mean, there are plus, plus and minus. Exactly. Questions. And it's not, a, it's not a bad thing, honestly. It's not. Uh, 
you do learn no matter where you are you will end up learning so much out of it what about celebrations in your life in general like after being to the US what are the good things in your life i think the uh, not a good thing but i think the best thing was meeting my husband awesome <laughs> i we met um about 8 years say hi to him <laughs> by the way <laughs> we've not seen each other for ages i know ages. it's been a long journey but i feel like again that that thing that something wonderful is going to happen to you that feeling i think my husband was also a part of it because i feel like everything has been kind of moving in that direction slowly steadily to be where i am today and i wouldn't change anything anything about it yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, you know, being a woman, it's extremely important for us to have that happy medium and work-life mm-hmm. balance. How do you manage to get that, or how do you manage your time? How has it been for you? <laughs> being a woman in dentistry is hard. I'm not gonna lie, and you know that, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, especially right after graduation when i was a director in aspen i was working away from the city like working in boston is very different it's a metropolitan city it's diverse it's got a very different vibe but when you move to the suburbs of massachusetts mm-hmm. you move away from the city you realize that it's a very narrow minded you know yeah. uh, tunnel vision that people have so overcoming those yeah. uh, stereotypical barriers or those prejudices yeah. biases which are very innate to a lot of people was uh, not easy mm-hmm. here unfortunately you have to deal with ageism sexism racism a little bit of bigotry unfortunately and you just have to find your way around it it can be incredibly frustrating uh, and it is very very challenging to overcome that so it's not been an easy journey but at the end of it it's just standing your ground being polite and giving it back not putting your head down yeah. and not not just shutting up absolutely up. just you know giving it back and that's an amazing point like never lose your self mm-hmm. respect just because someone else has said something yeah. to you it's like, no what i've learned in all these what i've learned in all these years is one respond don't react so calmly yes. politely respond stand your ground know your self worth and you know just 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 prove yourself worth you don't need validation from anybody that should just come from inside and that should mm-hmm. basically kind of radiate out of you the confidence should radiate out of you to command Absolutely. that respect you don't want to to earn that respect so it takes time it yeah. wasn't easy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but being a yeah, woman yeah. in dentistry is hard being an immigrant is extra hard Uh, it's harder, yeah, it's harder. Yeah. Uh, you know, being young and combating all of those, you know, age-old stereotypes that people have is not easy. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, I deal with it every single day at work, every single day. But it's just yeah. about just being calm and giving it back, <laughs> focused. Yeah. Apart from dentistry, I know you are amazing at <laughs> art. But tell us something else. Like, what else do you do? Oh my god, a little bit of art, obviously, but music, uh, and books. I think yeah, my. third love apart from dentistry unfortunately dentistry has the first spot i don't know how long <laughs> no, guys you, guys you know how she got 118 <laughs> on tofen without studying right her third love is books <laughs> right so it, it, has it to is be. so um in conclusion um would you recommend going for dds and agd or just dds or just agd what what would you say about it It honestly depends on what you want, right? It's everybody has their individual individual way of thinking. Yeah, or where they want to be. Right? Like everybody guess. kind of knows where they want to be. At least I had like five year goals and ten year goals. I want to be here in five years. I want to be here in ten years. So I'm sure everybody has those goals or plans or ideals. And it just you know whatever floats your boat at the end of the day. Uh, I would definitely yeah. not do AGD and DMD. If you have a choice, do DMD first and then do AGD later, because you will just get so much out of the program if you are a little more trained to the American way of working. Because for me, I spent my first three months trying to understand how the American system works, and then kind of getting as much as I could out of the AGD program. And I feel like those three months that I not wasted, but I spent getting acclimatized to the system, I just could have done mm-hmm. so much in that time. So um, I feel I would have got so much more out of AGD had I done it after DMD. 
Um, so if you're going down that route, do DMD first and then do AGD later. If you're only doing AGD, stick to it and move to a state where you can get to practice what you learned uh, without spending quarter million dollars in student loans. I think a great idea, honestly, is to do specialty. Because general dentistry is hard, man. It's hard. It's hard. And oh, I did get into MS Endo, by the way. After AGD, I forgot oh, to tell you this. I got into yeah. MS Endo and I got into DMD. And I had to make that decision where I choose between specialty and then moving out of Massachusetts or DMD and living in Mass. And I chose doing DMD and being a general dentist. Uh, but now in hind- you know, hindsight is 2020. I feel like doing MS would have been a better option. Jungle dentistry is hard mm-hmm. on your body. It's hard on your mind. It takes a lot out of you. And in terms of compensation, it's much, much lower than what a specialist would do in this country. So when mm-hmm. I think back to that regret that you were asking me about, if there's one thing I could change, I would probably have gone ahead with MS Endo rather than doing DMD and then practiced as a specialist, mm-hmm. maybe not in Massachusetts, maybe in you know Virginia, in Texas, in California, I don't know where, mm-hmm. but that is what I mm-hmm. probably would have changed. Uh, it's definitely a better option if you're more mm-hmm. driven by financial success. It's definitely a better mm-hmm. option even if you're more driven by didactic or you know clinical proficiency because focusing on one thing and being that master of one trade is being better than jack of all. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, DMD is still great, but I would put that as a first step, but there is nothing as good as having your postgraduate residency for sure. Yeah, good to know. I mean, I love how you explained all the points in detail. That was amazing. Like, thank you so much for doing that for us. And uh, thank you for being on this interview with oh. me. I I really miss meeting you. I hope the next time I come to East yeah. Coast, plan uh, I will get to meet you. Plan yeah.